Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, November meeting, board meeting for the CQC. Um, we have apologies this morning from uh, Jorah Gill and uh, Malta Gerhold, whose Malta, of course, is on his uh, long paternity leave. Um, particular welcome this morning to David Hastings, who's the chair of uh, the CQC's LGBT Plus Network. David, extremely welcome to you. Um, I'll introduce Henrietta in a moment, but you're, you're, you're obviously uh, welcome. Um, I think everybody else is normally here, but anyway, everybody's welcome, so that's good. Um, is there any declaration of interest that anybody needs to uh, raise? Good. All right. Minutes of the 17th October meeting, are they a true and accurate record of all we discussed? Excellent. I'll take silence as total assent. That's good. Um, there's a um, couple of items on the, the um, action log. Um, one is um, uh, sort of ongoing updates on the uh, digital and intelligence. And I, I think we might um, take this off the action log because I think by definition it's, uh, it's ongoing. Um, uh, but doesn't, just taking it off the op uh, op action log doesn't mean it's not uh, going to be continued. And then the, the, the other item is um, uh, uh, on the agenda for today, later anyway, so that's okay. Anything else arising? Um, no. Right. So that takes us uh, swiftly on um, to the National Guardian update. Um, Henrietta, extremely welcome. Thank you. And over to you. There we go. Uh, since I last attended uh, this board, which doesn't feel like a year ago, I have to say, um, I really believe that substantial changes have come about in the speaking up arrangements in England. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to present my 2018 annual report to you. Um, so just in brief, we now have 800 Guardians, Champions and Ambassadors across England. Uh, to date, they have handled over 12,000 cases. and. Um, the numbers are going up quarter on quarter. The largest group um, of cases is around bullying and harassment, and the second largest is around patient safety. And we've been providing training for guardians um, and development for boards of NHS trusts and foundation trusts. And we've recently published our 2018 survey. Uh, again, it shows that many guardians don't have protected time, and this impacts on the ability for them to do justice to their role. We found that if they don't have protected time, they're less likely to have access to their chief executive, to present to their board in person, to attend training or regional events, and probably most importantly, to seek feedback on their own performance. So uh, we call to all leaders of organisations to put sufficient investment into this role. And I'm pleased that many trusts are actually increasing the amount of protected time, but I think I'd like to see that go further and faster. Um, it again appears that the better organisations appear to have better speaking up cultures and we've um, published the uh, results of our survey showing the um, uh, perceptions of freedom to speak up guardians and then looked at the overall CQC rating and that's been very helpful. Um, we want organisations to use speaking up as a way of improving. As they say at West Suffolk, NHSFT, freedom to speak up, freedom to improve. And I think that's a good motto to actually show that this is not just about raising concerns, this is also about great ideas. And they've got some lovely examples of very junior members of staff being able to make significant changes to patient safety. We've completed the 12 month uh, pilot of our case review process um, and within that we're identifying and systematically tackling some of the barriers to speaking up but more than that we need to work out who needs to do what to make the changes happen and those include conflicts of interest so for example in one trust only one member of staff out of 9,000 had um, completed a conflicts of interest declaration. Uh, we're going to be looking in detail at settlement agreements in a case review that we'll be publishing shortly, but also bias um, in the way that investigations are conducted and also looking at bullying and harassment in more detail. And as a result of that, we've got some special projects that we're doing. Uh, we've created a four-nation alliance with the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh to look in detail at bullying and harassment and draw together organisations who've all got an interest in making that better. 
we're working in a round table with NHS employers, law firms, NHS um, improvement, and also the Department of Health and Social Care in detail around settlement agreement guidance and working with NHS England on implementing the conflicts of interest policy. And um, tonight I'm delighted that I'm going to be uh, presenting the first award for developing a supportive staff culture at the HSJ Awards. So this is not just about thinking about what's been going wrong, it's also about how we publicise what's going right. And our future priorities are to expand into primary care with the increased funding from NHS England and developing a new regional structure to have an integrated approach to speaking up across the patient pathway. And also to think carefully about phase two of our case review process so that we can get the maximum learning, but also have that focus on listening to individuals. Um, my ask of you as a board is, well, first of all, to say thank you for including this as part of Well Led. I think that really focuses the mind of organisations and also the way that you role model good practice with your 100 Freedom to Speak Up Guardian Champion Network, um, but also how we can help you to achieve your goals. So um, I really wanted to not talk for too long, so there was plenty of time for questions. Henrietta, that's, that's fantastic. And it does sound like terrific progress in a year. So, um, excellent. Ted. Uh, I, I agree, it has terrific progress. And, uh, and on my visits to hospitals, uh, I'm seeing a real sense of energy around this agenda, which, which I know is being driven by uh, Henrietta, her team, uh, and the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, so that's really good. As you say, Henrietta, it is a reflection of how good an organization is, how well they do this, which is why it's so central to our well-led inspections. And I should say I'm very grateful for the work that you and your team have done looking at our inspections and feeding back so we can continually improve our inspections, because this is something I think we need to keep central to well-led. Uh, it's all about culture. It is all about creating a culture in which, as you say, people can speak up because that drives improvement. And those are the organisations that really succeed. So we, we will keep it central to our well-led inspection. And I, I hope we can go on working with you to make sure that we are doing it as well as possible in the inspection, but also in our inter other interactions with trusts. I hope that the, the questions that we've asked in our survey will help to guide inspectors so that you know we can actually focus down on the most important questions to ask um, so that the right judgments can be made going forwards as well. I, I totally agree with that. We need to learn to do this better in terms of our inspections, but at the same time, in our interactions with organisations, drive the right culture as you do. Were you wanted to come in, Robert? Yeah, or? yeah. But, yeah. But I didn't want to queue down. Uh, no, well, I thought you were first. So, Ro Ro Robert and then John. Um, well, thank you. Um, I mean, and firstly, this is a tremendous advance on, on where we were this time last year, and it, it does show to me the the value of, <coughs> of developing networks. And I'd like to pay tribute to the guardians, uh, many of whom I've managed to meet at one or other of Henrietta's events. Uh, they are the most incredibly dedicated bunch of people, some of whom are working in very challenging circumstances indeed, and they deserve all the support that they can get. Uh, and it was really about that I had a, had, had a question. Um, it's known that the guardians and the way they're appointed, the way they're selected, and the way they're supported by their trust is quite variable across the piece. And I suspect that part of the problem <coughs> is uh, a, a challenge in finding the resource required to give them protected time. Uh, I mean, some of them will actually must be working way beyond the call of duty in terms of the challenges they have. Uh, and I wonder whether there's anything either CQC can do or the Henrietta can do um, which actually puts this more on the agenda of trust boards in terms of understanding that this is not a, a, an optional extra in terms of supporting guardians. It is actually a vital part of preserving or developing the culture in their own trusts. But in these financially challenging times, it, it, this is one of those areas which is like training. You know, it's going to be quite easy to, to, to stop doing. Do, do, do you want to respond to Henrietta? Name? Well, I, I think that, that boils down to uh, the risk that we have is that we are creating a cadre of emotionally intelligent, highly skilled and empathetic individuals and they need to be able to speak up into an equivalent type of board. The risk is when a guardian is doing the right thing and they're escalating issues and not getting the right response. So that's when they come to us and if we're really 
feel that they're getting stuck and we're not able to help move things forward, then that's when we'll be coming to you. Yeah. Chris, were you going to come in on, on, on this point? <coughs> With the microphone. Just on that point, um, it's a really interesting thing about to think about to the wider workforce agenda. So there's a lot, a lot of talk, and there will be over the next few weeks, about how we um, attract more people to work in health and care. And I think the link back to the board, so there'll be a general link about how do you make sure where you've got vacancies, you deal with that to manage uh, winter and beyond winter. But bringing this into the equation about how you make yourself an attractive employer by how you deal and respond to the concerns of, of, of colleagues in the organisation to drive a change generally, I think is, I think, a link back to the board. I think sometimes we, we go for a binary option as we need, to, we need to recruit more staff. But actually, there's only about retaining the staff that are in an organisation to value them to help improve the way organisations perform. Are you, uh, Ted, are you adding to that? Yeah. So if you, if you, if yeah, I yeah, I'll just, no, I'll come uh, I Well, I, I just wanted to come back to Robert's point. I, I, I mean, I think there is still, there will still be organisations that don't want to support their Freedom Speak Up Guardian effectively. And those are the organisations that really have the deficit in leadership because, I, it, I mean, this is, if they see this as an obligation mm -hmm. rather than as an essential way of driving the, the culture and the quality in their trust, they're looking at it at the wrong way. And I think that's what we've got to learn to test out. I mean, it's not a matter of have they got a Freedom Speak Up Guardian, have they ticked the box, but actually are they taking this agenda seriously and do they realise the importance of this agenda? And we've got to get that right in our inspections. John. You sure? That's yeah, right. well. <laughs> uh, Henrietta, I want to join others saying this was a very impressive and well written report, so thank you. Um, but also, can I commend you on your media appearances? Uh, because I thought they were very well measured and came over really clearly. Um, my question is looking ahead to your developing this in primary care. Can you just give us some thoughts about how that might go? Thank you. Um, so I'm a GP, and so it feels a bit strange that I spend more time in trusts than I do in primary care looking at how speaking up is handled. And I recognise that it is going to be complex. We've got 50,000 organisations spread across the country, lots of small teams, and lots of conflicts of interest, potentially. So we're working with some vanguard organisations, including um, a local medical committee, uh, a CSU, a commissioning support unit, and its associated CCGs, but also some large GP providers and defence medical services as our vanguard organisations, because we want to test out different models, recognising there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to this. Um, and then as we then start developing uh, different systems that will work, it's about having that engagement. And this is where our regional approach is going to make a big difference. We're adjusting our regions so that they're going to mirror the NHS England, NHS Improvement Regions with a regional engagement manager in each, in each uh, region so that they can then act as that, that glue to bring together all the parts of the system so we can get the guardians from the trusts, from the independent sector, from primary care, um, alongside the key backstop, if that's not a bad word to use at the moment, um, individuals from NHS England who are leading on performance and the contract but also professional advisors, the representatives, etc., so that we can really work out systems that will be effective and will create those opportunities for speaking up across organisational boundaries, which in my view is one of the hardest things to do. That seems fine. <laughs> <laughs> what, how are you connecting into, uh, how are you connecting into to Steve's outfit? So clearly as part of the prompts and the Chloe's in the world led, at the moment there's a requirement for uh, organisations to have speaking up arrangements and I think it's again that journey of discovery, you know we're, we're not a know-it-all organisation, we're a learn-it-all organisation and as we test out the different ways of this working we'll start seeing some themes about leadership and how the leadership of organisations enables every voice to be heard, great ideas to come to the fore and concerns to be raised. So, uh, Lewis and then Liz. Uh, thanks. Um, it's very interesting. I think there's a general point here about um, this as a model of cultural change in, uh, an organ in the NHS, and uh, as such a huge organisation in the NHS. And uh, that, that's a lesson that the wider system needs to learn, I think, because there may be other places, other parts of the, uh, the NHS, other sort of problems in the NHS that might adopt a similar style. Um, but I want to ask you about measurement. Um, and um, how, how we or how you will know over time 
um, that things are getting better. Uh, so I'm struck by, I think you're right to highlight the r relationship between uh, ratings uh, and the success of the, the, uh, the Guardian, although presumably there are different ways of interpreting that. It sounds like you might not get an outstanding rating unless you are doing the right thing by your freedom to speak up Guardian. So it's not entirely independent, uh, an independent set of ratings. Um, but I was, I'm also struck by, so sorry to introduce a slightly negative note here, but I'm also struck by the fact that about half of the, out, uh, the people who responded to the, to, uh, to the survey for outstanding trusts were saying that there might be detriment to the person who was speaking up. So that worries me that it happens at all. Um, it worries me that half the people in trust rated outstanding uh, are saying that. And so I just want to get your impression. Um, uh, I guess you're worried about that too. But, but also where, where we will go with measurement and over what period of time do you expect those things to be broken down? Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, there are lots of ways that we can do this measurement. One of them is in the staff survey, which is always a lag indicator. Um, but I think there's something about how organizations look at their total reporting. Clearly, this is an interim step, and the nirvana is that anyone can speak to anyone about anything, and they shouldn't have to go to a guardian. What we can say is that if there's no data or zero cases of speaking up, that's probably an indicator of concern. Um, and I was at Moorfields uh, this morning. In fact, they brought the entire trust together for the Barbican, and they recognised that the system that they'd had in the, pre in the first year didn't meet the needs of their staff because they had no cases and one case, and then they've changed the way they're doing it, and now people are actually speaking up through their guardian. So I think there's something about how trusts view their data, um, the data that we're publishing, how they're using that to compare themselves, but also... Um, in the case reviews that we do, we make recommendations. And when I go to a trust and a non-exec director or the chief exec or the guardian says to me, oh, well, what we did was when we read that report and then we, we used the recommendations as a kind of, um, you know, a gap analysis and we've immediately changed this and we've immediately changed that, if, well, if we start seeing the same recommendation coming up again and again, that's a sign of failure. So I'm describing failure. I think success is going to be, as we see the staff survey results improve, particularly in confidence about the way that investigations are done, um, about bullying and harassment, where the best in the NHS is still 20%, but also in uh, the, the work that's happening, for example, in Just Culture and some of the trusts up in the Northwest. If I could just come back briefly on that. There's a, there's a really good example in the report about, which is actually quite a shocking example of um, what's referred to as sewerage water um, being in a, um, I think, in a laboratory, mm. hospi uh, uh, a hospital laboratory. Um, and on the one hand, um, this is a success story because the involvement of the Guardian helped resolve it, so there's a measure of success. Um, but the question that it left with me was why on earth did this happen and how did it take the involvement of a Guardian to resolve it, or at least resolve it in a more permanent way? And so the difficulty of measurement encapsulated in that example where in what, on the one hand it's good, but on the other hand it's telling you something really awful. Unfortunately, what we're finding is that... Trust, mm, I should say it was an outstanding trust as well. And what we're finding is that things that have been left neglected for maybe many months or years, the root cause of it doesn't get sorted until the Guardian gets involved. And that's a, me that's a lesson back to trusts, to say, why does it take the involvement of the Guardian to tackle the root cause? You know, and I think, as an example, it's just extraordinary that the staff are so habituated oh, you know, the pipe's leaked again, clean it up, you know, and nobody thinks, well, we need to do this, we need to do that. And, and we've seen similar examples when it comes to recruitment practice, looking at junior doctor rotor gaps, looking at, um, you know, training on dignity and consent on infection control. It, there's something about the, the, the escalation from the Guardian that leads to the root cause being fixed in these situations. Liz. Um, yeah, I was going to ask a very similar question to Lewis, actually, uh, but uh, just to build on it, um, there, are some, there are some really good stories of Guardians speaking up leading to change, um, and I just wondered how you plan to uh, track and communicate those kinds of quite tangible impacts that that come about, so as well as the cultural impact, which is obviously crucial, the actual improvements that happen. I wondered if you were going to have any kind of 
tracker of recommendations and what's happened to them or or anything of that sort so that over time you've got a quite a big bank that can be communicated to to trusts to boards but also to staff you know there is a point in this because look at the sorts of changes it can lead to I look at that in three different ways. The first one is the recommendations we make from our case reviews. And the feedback we've had from Guardians is, could we simplify it? Because there's 73 at the moment, could we, and a bit duplicative, could we make it a bit more straightforward? And we're looking to do that so that there's a, a library of recommendations that all trusts should be easily able to demonstrate how they've done their gap analysis. Then the uh, case reviews, uh, sorry, case studies. And the case studies, I think, because they tell the stories. I mean, some people like data and some people like stories, and you know, so we have to have the stories. Um, and I, we're looking to build a library of case studies that people can read and you know, learn about in different themes. But I think more importantly than both of those is actually the feedback from the individuals who've been supported. And when we read the feedback, and it will often say things like, it's the first time I felt listened to, you know, this has made a big change in my working life, or now I feel safe, you know, happy that the patients are safe. It's that real time, real life feedback, which I think is, is you know, so in the way that boards have patient stories, um, some trusts are actually having staff stories as well. And I think there's, it, it's, it's opened their eyes to how it feels to be a member of staff in that organization. Mark. Thank you, Chairman. Henrietta, we were talking earlier, and um, I, I have to say I think it's uh, excellent that you continue to have a focus on bullying and harassment, and actually in terms of a measurement that could be something that you will see that you can have an impact on through, through the survey. But um, I was interested in the training of guardians that clearly you've implemented, but I wonder whether there was any um, planning to take that training and offer it to organizations to put it into their management training so that the managers, the ward managers, understand the role of the guardian and see the guardian as an enabler um, to manage effectively rather than um, anything other that they might think. So we've now trained over 500 people and we offer information sessions to a whole wide range of people who might be interested to learn more about it. Um, and in terms of uh, capacity, we've now trained up uh, guardians to be trainers so that they can deliver training regionally as well. And some of them are delivering that to guardians and champions, but also to others in their trusts. Um, and we've been thinking about how we can set the standard in terms of uh, training so that other organizations can deliver it because with a team of 11 now i do have a capacity issue that we can't be training everybody but we really want uh, training that gets delivered to managers to align with our um, with our narrative with the idea that speaking up is an entire spectrum um, and to ensure that managers see guardians as an adjunct to their role um, but also a, role, a, a, a route for themselves if they need to speak up about something as well. Um, so we're, we are um, planning that and uh, we'll be you know, publishing that and, and then working with uh, you know, um, providers who are commissioned to deliver training to ensure that it meets our expectations as well. Henrietta, I, I suspect that the, uh, the board would like to go on talking to you all morning. <laughs> I think there's a, a lot of interest and enthusiasm. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a lot of other things on the agenda. So I'm going to bring this to an end. But um, on behalf of everybody, uh, thank you very much for all you've done. I, I think we've all said, every, almost every speaker has said, uh, uh, fantastic progress in a year. So uh, thank you very much and congratulations. Right, so that does take us on, uh, Chief Executive, to your executive report. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I want to just say three things before I hand over to the uh, Chief Inspectors to talk about uh, the sections that they've, they've written. Um, uh, first thing, uh, the, there's been a, a lot of media interest in the case of Bethany, a 17-year-old inpatient with autism who was held for about 22 months in a seclu seclusion room in St. Andrew's Hospital. Um, it, it's raised a, it raised a number of questions around, around segregation and prolonged seclusion of people uh, with mental health problems, uh, learning difficulties and, and, and autism. Um, and so we've been asked by the Secretary of State to carry out a thematic review 
um, of, of segregation and, and also prolonged seclusion, um, as well as um, looking, looking at the use of restraint. Uh, and those two things are, are two slightly different things, um, but, uh, but, but it, it is a significant report, and, and I'm, I, I'm really pleased that, that, that we've been asked to, to carry out that, that work. So we're in the process of just agreeing the final, the final detailed scope of that report to make sure that, that, that what we produce is, is as everyone will ex, would expect, and also it has, it has genuine long-term long -term impact. Our, our current thinking is that we would do the report in, in two parts. There would be a, an initial report of some sort in May of 2019 as, as an interim report, with the final report being being published uh, before the end of the financial year 2019. So, um, as I say, the, the final details are being agreed with our colleagues at the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, but I think it's an important uh, report, um, and and I think it will it will bring together a number of issues that w which we've we've raised in in, in other reports uh, as well. So, um, I, I think I just wanted to make make the board aware that that's something which I know has been in the press a lot, and just give you a sense of timescales. Um, we um, the, the second the second thing uh, I wanted to talk about was uh, Peter, myself, and the three chief inspectors uh, appeared before the Health and Social Care Select Committee recently. Um, I, I think that was a, a, an important uh, session. We covered a, a range of topics uh, that, that, as you would expect, around uh, the NHS independent inspect in, and inspect independent hospital inspection findings range from ambulance services and mental health and uh, and uh, our, our engagement with the voluntary sector as long as, as well as our engagement with the uh, the nhs 10-year plan so i think a fairly wide-ranging session and, and i think uh, i think we all felt it was a very positive session in terms of the conversations that were had um and then thirdly um the initial findings from our your voice uh, employee survey um, I think we've had we've had our initial findings, and, and our, the details are, are in the paperwork. But um, I, I think, in some respects, our, our overall engagement sco engagement score looks like it has dropped slightly by one percentage point. Um, and but but our three S engagement index, which is a slightly different cut of the data, uh, looks like it it, it has uh, it has it has um, it has held up and is above the civil service average. So. What we'd like to do is to, to take away the detailed findings which, are, which we've got down at team level, pull together an action plan, and then bring all of that back to the back before the board uh, in February. Um, because I, I think what we have seen is there's been some improvements in some areas. I think there's still a strong sense, sense, sense of mission and motivation in the organization, and people believe in what we do. Um, but equally, there are still some concerns ar around around technology. There's some concerns ar around uh, learning development. Um, so I tried. Right, there's some concerns around um, str around knowledge of strategic direction. But some of the things that have been mentioned in in earlier years around learning and development and around well-being and workload have improved slightly. So. Uh, but I think it is a quite a mixed picture across across the organisation. So rather than uh, trying to to talk at at length now in in generic terms, we want to break that down by directorate and by team, so we can have a, a more a more a more uh, structured conversation about that in February. So, Chair, if I could hand over to to Andrea. To should we just sorry, just okay. sorry just should, yeah. we, should we just pause? There? Is there anything anybody wanted to raise before we move on, Liz, and then Lewis? Um, yes, just on the uh, review that we've been asked to do on um, segregation, seclusion and restraint and the scope. So, I mean, my sense from um, sort of people out there is there's a little bit of kind of, well, what's another review going to do? Because there have been other kind of reviews and people know a certain amount about what the problems are. So I just really wanted to, to ask whether as part of our review, part of the scope, we will be looking at... Um, effective approaches to reducing seclusion, restraint, and segregation. Because so, I think pointing to the good practice and how it can be spread just might get us further forwards than a review that focuses, that overly focuses on what the problems are, if you see what I mean. Uh, and the second thing is um, who the who the review might be directed at in terms of who needs to do what. Uh, and I wondered whether that will include CQC itself, because there might be learning for us for our own inspection, et cetera. Um, finally, I know that the Equality and Human Rights Commission has been doing some work on restraint, and other people have been as well. So it'd be good to, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've got this in train, but just to make sure that we're kind of linking up with other bodies as useful. So, Lewis, do you want to 
come in and then um, come back to uh, Ian and probably Ted. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, well, Lisbon is making um, almost exactly the point I was going to make. I mean, I think... Um, so I, I, but I'm going to make it anyway. The... the, uh, uh, the um, it's true that, that, that there is a version of this report which um, we could write now, um, and it would be about uh, the lack of facilities for people with so-called complex needs, uh, about the position that CCGs are in, the sort of out of sight, out of mind problem for people who have um, particular difficulties, the involvement of the private sector, uh, the use of the Mental Health Act, all of that creating a perfect storm in which vulnerable people are essentially left uh, in a, a weird combination of care and neglect. Uh, and uh, so we could write that. We could write the one about restraint, which is about overuse, the problem of measurement, problem, problems of definition, and what's the alternative. Um, so um, could we use that as our starting point in this review? Because um, we have had quite a lot that's, uh, that's uh, come up with those conclusions. And here would be a chance to do something a little bit different, to look for solutions and to find a way of giving the solutions force uh, and, and therefore making them happen. And, and focusing on that, the, the, uh, not, not trying to, uh, I, th I think what we need to understand is, given that everybody understands that that is the situation, what are the obstacles that have got in the way of, doing, uh, of solving this in the past? And for me, that is the key question, not what the problem is, that's easy, the, the, what are the obstacles? Because I think a lot of good people have tried to address this and they've done it unsuccessfully. Yes, uh, I, I, think, I think I would, I would agree with, with both of those points. I, I think what we want to try and do, uh, before I bring Ted in to talk in a little bit more detail about this, but what we want to try and do is, is, is produce a report which, which does do something. I, I think if this is a report that, that just sits on a shelf somewhere and describes a problem, then, then we, we haven't really achieved very much. And as you said, um, a number of people have written reports in this area in the past. So job one will, of course, be to review the existing, existing literature. Um, but we need to do something which does <coughs> genuinely make a difference. And my sense is the Secretary of State uh, in, in his direction is, is keen to, for us to do something that makes a difference. Um, and, and that is why the report, well, that's why the process will take a reasonably long period of time. Um, uh, it's not something that we are going to, to do particularly quickly. And I know some people would like to see action sooner. Um, but, but I think the, the aim is to bring a lot of the voices that are practitioners in this, in this space into the room and make sure that their, their perspectives and thoughts are, are, are brought to bear as well. So I don't know whether I can bring Ted in just, just to build on that. Well, the scope is, 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 is still being signed off. So I'll feed back these comments to, to, to Paul to make sure that this is included. But my understanding is that we very much want to focus on just the things that, that Lewis and, and Liz have, has raised, have raised, because uh, our inspection reports describe the problem. There's no point in just kind of collating our inspection. And that's the starting point, to, to, just to make your point. That, you know, what we found is the problem. What we need to do is to work with the people involved and the people who've got good practice mm -hmm. in this regard and the people commissioning these services to actually find a solution and a positive way forward. And I think that is a real test for this report and uh, I mean the fact that, that others have looked at this before and not been able to move it forward significantly is a challenge for us but we need to rise to that challenge which is is why we're giving so much thought to, to, to getting the scope right. Can Good. I just add a point, <coughs> yeah. uh, it's just to add a point about who we will involve in the um, in the work and, and the scope because uh, Ian quite rightly has said that um, we will be speaking to practitioners but we've also included in the scope uh, that we will be speaking with people with lived experience of this um, uh, in people um, and their families so that we have a full picture both in terms of uh, current situation but also what can go forward and uh, the uh, that the overarching group which Steve chairs um, around uh, thematic reviews is kind of taking an overview of this to make sure that it links up with other aspects of our work on that front as well. So Andrea, while you have the, the floor, as it were, do you want to carry on with your part of the report? Thank you very Please. much, Chairman. On Allied, what I would like to do is to update the board uh, because the report was written last Thursday and this is a constantly evolving picture. So as the report sets out, on the 5th of November, we wrote to 84 local authorities to advise them that we believed that service failure was likely as a consequence of likely business failure and that they should prepare their contingency plans. 
and that's to ensure that if it did happen, they could deliver on their statutory duty to preserve continuity of care for the people using those services. And just to reassure the board, that's everyone, including people who pay for their own care. Since that time, we have identified from the information supplied a further two local authorities um, who are affected, and that brings the total up to 86. And that covers around 9,300 people in England alone. Uh, it, there are people um, who are receiving services from Allied in uh, Wales and, uh, and Scotland, and we are in uh, close dialogue with them as well. Last Friday, Allied Healthcare wrote to local authorities, their staff and people using their services to tell them that they would either be handing contracts back to local authorities or transferring them to other providers. And the company also advised that their lending facilities had been extended from the 30th of November for up to three weeks to facilitate that process. Local authorities are working with uh, the local allied branches to understand what this will mean for services in their area and whether they need to implement the contingency plans they have prepared. And that activity is being supported by the Local Government Association and the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services overseen by the Department of Health and Social Care. CQC is working closely with all these partners, um, pay tribute to the market oversight team who are doing a tremendous amount of work um, on all of this at the moment, to monitor the ongoing situation with Allied and to provide advice and support to the department, local authorities, the LGA and ADAS. And I'd just like to say absolutely recognise that this is a worrying time for people who rely upon allied healthcare services, their families and carers, as well as the staff who work for them. And I'm sorry that such concern has been caused, but I'm confident and I think that the subsequent events which I've just described to you have proved it to be the case that it was appropriate for CQC to make this notification as it has given local authorities more time to put in place contingency plans to main, maintain continuity of care for people, which is the prime focus and the responsibility of our market overnight scheme. I just wanted to make sure that I brought everybody up to date on that. Uh, the second item that you've got from uh, adult social care on the uh, paper is the uh, successful outcome of the prosecution of Hill Green. This is a very short note uh, for the board because uh, this happened last Thursday. Uh, the judgment was brought down um, uh, guilty on two counts um, that we had brought um, to prosecute uh, Hill Green Care Limited. Uh, they were fined £300,000. We um, were awarded full costs. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the judge was quite trenchant in her criticism um, of the company. I will be bringing to the board at the next meeting uh, the report that pulls together the outcome of that uh, case and uh, a wrap-up report on all of the recommendations that were made in the independent investigation that Sir Paul Jenkins carried out earlier this year uh, so that you can be assured that all of the lessons uh, which we committed to taking forward from this particular case um, have been uh, uh, implemented or at least there are clear plans to take them uh, or to put them into implementation next year. So thanks, Andrew. I mean, both those are for report, not for discussion. But can I just say, I mean, having been involved in um, not just Allied, but the work of the, the market oversight team generally, I just most of their work is not visible for good reasons, but it's terrific work. And I'd like just to echo what you said about congratulating them on, on the work they do. And, and similarly, um, and I'll be saying more about this in a, a little bit later in the meeting, uh, I think we should congratulate the, the, the team that, that brought the prosecution for Hill Green and everybody that was involved in that. Uh, again, um, a very good outcome. Um, Thank you. I mean, I think you know the the work of both the inspection team and the legal team in bringing you know there was a tremendous amount of work that went into that. Um, and so, thank you. I'm sure they will appreciate the board's um, uh, support for that. Good. Thank. You. Yeah. Having said it was uh, not for discussion, Robert. <laughs> Well, just a question, really, about the allied healthcare business. There, a quite public attack was made on the CQC by or on behalf of allied healthcare when we first made the announcement. And I wondered whether, um, Andrew, I mean, 
and a robust response was, was made to that. But I wonder whether there is any way in which the, the nature of what we do and, and how it is done inhibit an, a, a full exp explanation to the public in response to that sort of criticism? I'd say two things, um, Robert. The first is that I wrote to the chief executive um, of Allied Healthcare after those uh, attacks were um, made and set out in uh, quite clear detail uh, why it was that we had um, made the decision and uh, the issues that had contributed to that. And the, uh, this is not a decision that we take lightly. Um, this has a tremendous impact, as I've said, on people who are using services and staff. Uh, it is, uh, in our schema delegation, a decision that I make um, in consultation with the chief executive and the legal team based on the advice of the market oversight team. We had several management review meetings considering um, uh, the information that we had available to us and, um, uh, and there was total due care and consideration put into making that decision and I stand by it um, and I set out for uh, the chief executive who actually I don't think has um, uh, uh, responded to me but there we go um, uh, we are in daily dialogue so maybe you thought he didn't need to uh, but um, you know set out in clear detail to him why we'd made that decision and when journalists have asked us, we have told them um, uh, that there was a, a very clear um, basis for it. I'm not going to kid you, I've had sleepless nights worrying about it, obviously, um, but it, it was the right decision to make. And I think that the fact that on Friday, what they said was, and now we have extended the uh, lending facilities for up to three weeks, demonstrates that it, we, the, the um, a view that we had on the 5th of November that there, there was the likelihood of service disruption as a consequence of um, uh, likely business failure by the end of the month um, was a fair um, uh, position to have and nobody but nobody would have thanked us for telling people the money was about to run out the day before the money ran out. Um, and so I think that we were in the right and proper position, um, and which is part of the reason why I wanted to make a clear statement today as well. Good. Um, Ted, on to you. Uh, th <coughs> thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, members of the board will remember we released a report called Under Pressures about uh, pressures on emergency departments last winter. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for NHS providers to have circulated to, to help <coughs> us communicate to trusts and remind them of that guidance that we produced uh, in May of this year uh, as they go into this winter. Uh, and we're now in the middle of November, and middle of November is when the acuity of patients starts to increase, usually because of the, the cold weather and, uh, and the winter viruses, and that's when the pressures start building up on acute services in hospitals. So it's very important they take into account all the guidance we provided, uh, knowing that services are going to be under pressure, as we've highlighted in, in our reports over the year. I, I will be uh, writing to Trust again uh, just to remind them of the guidance as, uh, as well, this week probably, uh, just to make sure that, that they've all had a chance to see it and review it and take it into account in their uh, plans for their service. Uh, also, uh, the IRMA report, the Ionizing Radiation Regulations <coughs> report, uh, uh, was published uh, recently. Uh, this is an annual report that details all the adverse incidents that are identified in the use of ionizing uh, ra radiation I I in healthcare. Uh, and we hi highlight the uh, instances that have occurred, but also the learning that comes from them. And that report has been well received. Uh, by the, the sector. Uh, you'll remember earlier on uh, this year we presented the Rock Award to the IRMA team uh, because of the, the great work they're doing in, in with the new regulations that came in this year, but also the report they produced earlier in the year on radiology backlogs. I thought a nil report from you, Steve, was too good to be true. So. <laughs> <laughs> Steve. Yeah, it was useful being on holiday, wasn't it, for, for you anyway, um, the, uh, as well as me. Uh, I just want to uh, briefly mention two things that have happened in the last week or so. The um, Health Select Committee have produced an excellent report on uh, prison health care, or health care of prisoners, of which we uh, gave evidence in person and in writing. And uh, it's just to, to say to the Board, there are a number of recommendations in their report for us 
and we're currently um, putting together a response. Uh, and the reason I raise it is that because uh, Lewis uh, raised an issue about healthcare in prisons, very vulnerable people, obviously, and uh, one of the recommendations addresses that. Uh, it talks about um, ratings, about the extent to which prisons enable prisoners to live healthy lives, uh, not only the quality of provision, uh, but the extent to which all aspects of prison life enable prisoners to enjoy fundamental right to health. It talks about our um, legal powers of entry into prisons. Uh, it commends our work with HMIP, but also asks uh, that some work is done to look at uh, the effectiveness of their recommendations through their letters. Uh, but it also suggests that the Secretary of State should ask us through a Section 48 order to look at uh, health uh, within uh, prisons too. So there are important recommendations. I think we should bring back our response to the board in some form because it has been an issue uh, raised here and also at the RGC. Thank you. Uh, and I mean, it's hugely important work, so we're not going to have a discussion about it now, but I certainly welcome it coming back, Steve, when, when the time is right. Chris, I think you had one short yes. item. Uh, so the board will know that uh, one of the uh, aims of CQC is to encourage improvement. Um, equally outstanding is um, a, a, an opportunity to look at how organisations make those improvements from the perspective of individuals' human rights, looking at fairness, respect, equality, uh, dignity and autonomy. And the, the publication is an, is an update of publication looking at uh, a, a number of case studies which show not only the ethical case for why organisations should protect and promote people's human rights, but also the economic and business case. This is about um, services improving in a number of areas. So the resource is designed to help um, organisations understand what they can do to improve uh, their own performance. It's obviously also designed to give people a sense of what they should expect. Um, we know it's already had a positive response from um, the different sectors that have been involved. And it's interestingly a cross-sector collaboration, and I think that will be important as we take this uh, this work forward. Paul's obviously been leading the work and been um, heavily involved with it, but we just thought it'd be important to uh, update the board here. Good, Th thank you. And miraculously on time, welcome, Mark. Seamless, Seamless. absolutely fantastic. Ian, are you introducing? Are you starting on performance, or is Mark, or is, I think Mark, is Mark? Straight into you then, sir. Thank you, uh, Peter. So um, this is the uh, Q2 performance report, a uh, six-monthly update on where we are against our uh, commitments set out in the uh, business plan. Um, just some headlines I, I, um, from myself, then we can get into some questions, uh, perhaps. Um, um, I, think, I think the report is showing um, an improving picture overall. Um, um, a number of our organisational health indicators are... Um, uh, improving and uh, in a good uh, in a good position. Um, particularly pleased that some of the um, indicators from um, our call centre, the NSCSC, are back on track and above uh, target. So delivering um, their uh, measures. Um, the hospitals areas are con conducting all their inspections uh, in line with the reinspection um, uh, rules that we we set, and starting to see some improvements now within the um, report timeliness, which is uh, good. Uh, Good to um, see, and and you'll notice uh, an improving position overall on report timeliness, and also um, against our registration applications. So I think overall, as context of um, um, a, a good and improving position, um, there still remains much much to be uh, much to be done. I think one of the things for us from the report is showing that we need to now, as, as we start to hit the targets and commitments commitments that we make is that we start to do that in a kind of uh, sustainable way so we're actually starting to hit those regularly and we are I think starting to see that so we just need to um, uh, uh, continue to, to, to track that quite um, quite um, closely um, we've put in into the report um, the poll survey results which was something that was asked for at the board last period um, so that's in there but but clearly we've got the um, the broader CQC staff survey um, uh, results coming through now, which we're just analysing, uh, and that will be coming back to the board in, in its broader sense. But I wanted to just draw attention uh, to that. Um, I mean, Chris might want to say something on the on the um, on the finance side, but hopefully that helps as a way into the conversation. Peter. 
Thanks, Mark. Chris, do you want to say anything? Then we'll come back and open it up uh, on, on the whole form and so forth. Yeah, just to add on, on the finances. Uh, so currently underspent uh, as an organisation by 400k. We're still forecast uh, to overspend at the end of the year, which is um, predominantly pressures in hospitals directorate. Uh, but having seen latest figures, I'm fairly confident that we, we won't overspend by the end of the year and would be on budget. Right. Thank you, Chris. Mark. Chris, could I, could I just um, um, almost make one statement and then just ask you to clarify something? So, so the, 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 the statement is just to, to, to make very clear that uh, we will um, uh, get the grant in aid. Uh, it's called a budget, but, it, it, but by definition it can't really be a budget, can it? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an activity which you can't forecast the, the, the volume of. So uh, it, it's something that... that has to be paid under grant. This is activity that we can't control, uh, and it has to be paid uh, under grant and aid, and it will be. So, although the, it says here there's an overspend on the budget, that's, that, that somehow conveys the wrong impression. I just wanted to sort of clarify that. Um, and then just to ask you to clarify, uh, uh, in um, uh, 6, uh, 6B, it says there's a year-end deficit of... of, of uh, uh, 0.9 million, and then in, in, in 6C, the next paragraph, it says an overall surplus of 1.8 million. I think I can work out <laughs> what, what this is meant, but it does appear to be a contradiction. So could you just clarify that, yeah. please? Uh, so, yeah, just clarify. So, so in terms of overspend, we're looking at our revenue expenditure, uh, which is forecast overspend. Uh, income is higher than budget this year, uh, and is, is currently in forecast to be. So that, that's uh, the overall net surplus position is when you take both uh, things into account. I'm very clever. I worked that out, but I just <laughs> I then doubt, doubted myself, so I wanted to be, uh, have it confirmed. Other questions or comments from people on our performance? Cri oh, I, for a moment, I thought you were getting away really lightly, but go on, Liz. <laughs> uh, thank you. I've got a couple of... Is this is on the whole of the performance and finance report, is it? Yes, please, yeah. Uh, okay, a couple of questions. Um, First question, um, is there a reason why our expenditure is uh, somewhat backloaded? Uh, is that something we need to think about for the future, or is it just it's worked out that way and it's not really a, a challenge for us? It's just sometimes sometimes that those backloaded expenditure leads to sort of a bit of risk at the point of year end, and it can suggest that we've let some things slip. I don't know. Um, that's one question. Um, second question, uh, and perhaps I should know this, is about our business planning for the next financial year, uh, because it strikes me that some of the patterns of performance here, and some are also some of the, the staff um, surveying results, might suggest uh, the need to slightly rebalance priorities or, and or KPIs, and I just wonder if we've started that process and if we're doing it. Uh, and finally, I've got one specific question, sorry, while I've got the floor, which is on the, the slide page 94 business plan priorities um, starting to implement registration for those directing and controlling care this seems to have been pushed into medium to longer term and I, and I, I know that we agreed some time ago that this was something that was quite important and was going to happen and I just wondered if somebody could comment on uh, what the implications are of that uh, not happening until medium to longer term thank you Liz um, uh, I'm not sure, Chris, whether you want to start, and then, then Mark, or other way around. Um, so in terms of the phasing and the backload of spending, uh, so quite a large proportion of that was known and it was planned and anticipated for. There are some elements where um, uh, our recruitment is, is increasing. Um, and in terms of your point about next year, that's the work that we're doing uh, now uh, and taking to ET next, next week in terms of business plan for next year and what's the... Uh, what do we know from this year that we need to take into next year as part of our planning? Thank you. Just, just to add to that, the um, part of that is looking at our uh, measures and targets for next year as well. So, so looking at the, um, the staff survey and where we are on the commitments we set and the resources that we have next year, just to kind of re do that rebalancing. So uh, alongside the budget will be the discussion on measures and targets. Uh, Ted. Can I just come back on that point? Because, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really great that the hospitals are delivering the number of inspections that, that we planned for, but, and it's great credit to, to, to the teams out there doing this work. 
but uh, and also bringing down the report, uh, the, the time take to produce reports, and great work going on on that as well. So enormous credit to the teams doing this. But I think the staff survey shows that that is having an impact on, on workload. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, we need to square that as we go forward to the next financial year. And our, our main priority in hospitals at the moment is focusing on what we call lightening the load, which means how can we improve the way we work to, 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 to manage the risk we're having to manage without, without so much pressure on the frontline directors and actually uh, uh, the frontline staff. And I think that's a very important uh, phase we've got to go into next year. I agree, John, and then Lewis. A um, couple of things. First, to uh, welcome the reduction in the backlog of report writing, and that's a commendable thing. And looking at some of the other figures, um, I'm happily not against considering the possibility that I'm optimistic there is some genuine shift in the report writing. Um, timeliness, I think um, the, the effort is beginning to come through. Um, my other question is slide 37 on action against long-term in breach, adult social care and primary medical services. And there's a section that says there's no active or planned inspection on, or enforcement. I just wondered if you could clarify for me what that figure represents in terms of services being received by people. Shall we take Lewis's question, then we'll come back and answer, have answers for John Scott, Liz? Uh, it's a completely different subject, but it's, um, yeah, it's about the performance. It's, it's the, um, Ted, I should have given you advance notice of this, really, because it's about the mental health part of the uh, performance report, and in particular, the Mental Health Act uh, element. Um, but uh, it does, the, the, the two, so the two slides are on uh, slide 32 and 33. Uh, Mental Health Act is very topical at the moment, as you know, there's been a review, it's just reached its final stages, um, and the review uh, panel uh, has, has now completed its meetings, I'm on the review panel, I should say, and CQC itself is formally on the review panel. Um, uh, something quite uh, um, striking about the uh, availability of second opinion doctors on slide 32, I just wondered whether you were able to say anything about, about that, so this is the... Uh, doctors who are able to confirm the plan of care for patients detained by the mental, uh, under the Mental Health Act. And there's been a dramatic rise in, in the availability for doctors assessing community treatment orders. Uh, it just so happens that's one of the most contentious areas of the Mental Health Act review. Um, and then there's the steady rise in our monitoring visits for, um, for patients who are detained. Uh, I, I must admit I've slightly lost track of what those what the primary purpose of those monitoring visits is. Um, it's described as ensuring that the, the, the spirit of the Mental Health Act is being applied to pa patient safety. And I wasn't sure what we meant by the spirit of the Mental Health Act. Is it about preservation of human rights? I imagine it about something like that. Sorry, sorry, Ted, I was, I was going to um, come back to Andrea to uh, answer uh, Liz's question and then come to... Yeah. Yep. So I think I've, I've got a, a few that I could comment on there. The, the question about registration and the plan that we agreed around uh, how we registered services at a higher level and as, as, it, as is explained in the report, because of the work that we're doing on registration transformation and the time that is taking, we're not in, the, uh, we're not in a position yet to implement the policy that we've agreed. What that means is that um, it does, I, what that means is that we're continuing on in the way that we are at the moment. So we are continuing on with registering services at a location level and then taking um, uh, regulatory uh, action, both um, monitoring, inspecting, rating, and if necessary, enforcement action at that level. So there's no loss um, uh, of that. The second thing that it does mean is that apart from in specific circumstances where we think that there are uh, that um, there is risk, we are not doing provider level assessments yet. So again, there's a, another stream of work that is going on to develop that provider level assessment. But until we've been able to routinely register people at that level, those provider level assessments are not going to be taken forward. However, there are services that are 
um, uh, registered um, uh, at that level and we are taking action um, uh, uh, against them um, in, in some circumstances where we do know that there is risk, where taking action at a provider level is actually the right and proper thing to do. Um, so it's it's delayed it, it's still there on, on the work timetable and it will be delivered. Um, just to comment on the uh, point about rebalancing priorities, I mean, just to echo what Ted has said about the impact of workload and work-life balance. You can see those figures in uh, for adult social care uh, in here. Uh, I am acutely conscious of that. Um, it replicates itself again in the full survey. Those are things that we are going to have to take into consideration as we move forward um, uh, and think about the impact on our staff who are working very hard and in adult social care in an utterly relentless way of constantly trying to respond to risk and trying to um, uh, cope with problems. So um, we do need to think about that. And last but not least, the gap on the, um, uh, the, those services that um, are in breach for more than uh, four quarters. Uh, the, our expectation is that we would have action of some sort uh, being taken with them, either as, as you've identified here, that we're either going in and inspecting, we have just inspected, we've got enforcement action underway. Um, any of the, there are 164 for us in adult social care at the moment. Uh, that don't have an action logged against them. Uh, each of those will be being reviewed by the um, inspector who's holding the portfolio uh, and their management chain to ensure that they can come into one of those other categories. And sometimes it's just a lag in, in, in CRM in terms of you know, an inspection may have been planned, but it may not just have kind of um, uh, hit, hit here. So we've always given ourselves a bit of a gap because we wouldn't necessarily expect 100% to be having everything Thing, uh, signed, sealed and delivered in CRM to feed into this report, um, but I can assure you that uh, all of these will be actively being looked at um, by the team and, and in fact we have improved our performance in uh, making sure that we've got um, uh, plans against each of those locations. Steve, you're, you're nodding violently, so uh, I, I... Well, I'm not nodding violently, but I am nodding, Chairman. <laughs> well, I, so, um, I say, so you weren't <laughs> nodding off, you were nodding in agreement. <laughs> I'm, I'm very much with this, and uh, if you look back... Um, Would you like me to adjudicate? Uh, thank you. No, if you look back on the really graphs nodding. for two years ago, I think uh, to support Andrea, um, the performance has improved dramatically. Uh, and part of that is the work very closely with uh, Mark's team about how uh, we record these issues because some are in breach over one issue you go back and they're in breach over something else and uh, there does need to be a bit of a, a lag and, and within the gp and dental end of course there are those that are deregistering and that's a, a delay as well but this is a success story for us actually over la over the past five years i think that was nodding violently but anyway uh ted um <coughs> sorry th thank you um Lewis, uh, the, as you know, the second opinion that appointed doctors, uh, the demand is going steadily up. Uh, and uh, the, the Mental Health Act team have been recruiting new doctors to the panel, and that is helping us sustain our current performance. Uh, it's quite a complex story, uh, uh, and some of the KPIs may be structurally wrong. For instance, the KPI about uh, electroconvulsive therapy is actually virtually impossible for us to achieve because of the of the way that the 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 the, uh, uh, the, the second opinion doctors are commissioned, so I, th I think there are issues we need to look at in this, and I think it's it's welcome that this this needs to be reviewed as part of the our response to the to the mental health act review going on at the moment. Um, th there has a lot been a lot of work being done to try and make sure we're meeting demand, and uh, and uh, as I say, it's important to, to to stress that. But there are ongoing issues in terms of our ability to meet the KPIs as they exist at the moment. I think the community treatment orders are only a very small proportion of the total, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the medicines, second opinion, appointed doctors. So, so the so CTOs, I think, may be of interest, but they actually are not a very big part of the whole picture. I mean, that, that, that's probably, uh, uh, but uh, if for more than that. There's a positive to, thing, though. Yeah, they <laughs> the, the, uh, seem to be getting a lot better. Uh, the, well, they're getting a lot better, but it's, I mean, the, these percentages, it's very small numbers. Uh, so, so that's why there's been long sw big swings in the, in the CTO figures. Well, well, the medicines, as you see, is much steadier, and that's much higher numbers. Um, so I, I think, does that answer your question? Uh, 
the other part was about the, uh, the the spirit of the Mental Health Act being applied to the care in the in the Mental Health Act monitoring visits. The, mon the monitoring well, visits uh, uh, are to look at the uh, compliance with the Code of Practice around the Mental Health Act, uh, uh, and they they feed into into our report that comes out on, on a yearly basis, uh, and it, and that does show, as I'm sure you're aware, a very mixed picture in terms of compliance with the Code of Practice uh, around the Mental Health Act. Uh, and I suppose the, the challenge is uh, how is the system responding to that and is it responding effectively? And, I, and again, I hope that's part of the review that, that you're involved in. Good. Thank you. Anything else on performance? Uh, oh, yeah, Paul. Could I, could I just check, um, Chairman, that I mean, the, the, at the back end of the performance report, we've got the business plan priorities, the, the red stuff, and, the, and also the risks, the red stuff in there. Is that all going to be covered in the next bit? Because I think it does relate to change, essentially. But is that, that where we, we do that? So I think that's a very good segue into... Uh, in, into well, I don't want, to, don't want to miss it. <laughs> no, 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 it's too exciting to miss. You're absolutely right. Kirsty. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, just to pick up those, the, 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 the risk the risk register. I think those three risks are red at the moment, but I think if you had some arrows showing how red they were, they would be on the slightly, they'd be slightly less red than they were last month, but I'm still not wanting to take them out of red just yet because there's quite a bit of work we've got to do to move us, to move us through those. But I would hope in the next couple of months they'll start to move to red amber, which is, which is definitely a, an improvement, I think. Okay, there's quite a lot of detail in the change paper um, that we put forward today, so I'm just going to pull out a few highlights and then take questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, in terms of some of the work we've been doing around our change portfolio and looking to assure that, we've now concluded the work on the assurance of the change portfolio and now have a baseline plan on which we can monitor delivery against. That's been quite a, a, a big piece of work to really make sure that we have delved down into the detail of the planning that sits in each and every one of those lines to ensure that we have both the capability and the capacity in place or a plan in place to, to ensure that we are able to deliver against that. So we'll now start to report against that on a, on a, uh, on a regular basis. As well as that piece of work, we've been doing some work around our target operating model for delivering change, and uh, we are making good headway in, into that, and hopefully we'll be able to come back uh, maybe next month with a, an outline plan around our target operating model for both the, the governance, change control, and the process we have around delivering change effectively within the organisation. As well as that, uh, I think I brought last month some outline around our frameworks with um, the reporting frameworks. We've now started to use those uh, initially, uh, very small amounts of data going in, but that's now going to start to pick up pace and we have a delivery plan over the next three months around getting that data really embedded into our, um, into our reporting so that we can track both expenditure, resource use and delivery against the plan on a, on a, on a, on a much more detailed basis than we have in the past. In terms of our strategic programmes, registration is making good progress. Uh, we, are, we are now into the, sec the sort of alpha stage. We've identified what our minimum viable product is we're going to test out in this stage, and that's um, uh, domiciliary care on a sort of straightforward path, and that basically takes an end-to-end -end approach for uh, taking people through that. We're using a service design approach to building that and delivering that, which means that we are really engaging with both internal customers and end users on that space is to ensure that what we deliver is the right thing. As well as that, we've built a continuous improvement or a chain quality improvement work stream within, within, the, within the registration uh, program, and we've developed terms of reference for that, and actually a couple of weeks ago, they held a, sort of a sprint, for want of a better word, where they were looking at a number of a number of areas uh, where we can start to lean out our processes and uh, have now identified two or three areas where we can actually start to implement some really significant changes. Initial, initial uh, findings where we have processes that can take about five days on the registration to, to five, five weeks, I should say, to, and uh, just taking those out, we've knocked out sort of weeks of time, not just days, in terms of looking at how we can improve the efficiency of that. So again, good progress in there. 
And then I think within the registration space, we're also starting to think about what does all this mean in terms of our organisational design and what does that mean from, from the piece of work that we're doing around, around the, the, um, the, the, the way we're going to be working in future and looking to expand that programme to include an organisational design element in that to ensure that we are best organised to take best use of those changes as we make them. In terms of monitor, uh, inspect and rate, we had some work around uh, share around the um, uh, adult uh, adult information exchange and a GP a provider information exchange. Uh, that's now gone back into discovery because we, we weren't able through the, the initial bits of work that we did to really get a, a very solid business case for investment. So we've taken that back into discovery. We're learning from the work we've done on registration and put taken a, um, a service design approach to this and really starting to scope out what we're doing. We've brought in a programme director to sit across the top of the entire programme to really ensure we've got some rigour in how we're delivering and managing that piece of work. The work we're doing around digital is ongoing. Um, we are rolling out new phones, or we're trialling new phones with a plan to start to roll those out before Christmas. Um, those are smartphones and trying to improve people's uh, usage rather than being on the BlackBerry. We've now completed the rollout of the laptops and uh, are starting to look at how we can do some, re how we can put a program of work in around business change to really take the benefits of, opera of uh, Office 365 as that starts to come forward, looking at how we roll out things like Teams to really improve collaborative working. We're also looking at our underpinning architecture. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, an ongoing uh, has been a source of ongoing frustration for our staff around the, sort of st the stability of some of our systems. We've now started to commence work to take our, our business reporting system out and into the cloud and that's now, that's now starting to gather pace and we're also looking at what we do around replacement of our CRM system and we're using uh, using um, our registration program as a bit of a stalking horse for starting to build out a new system to for us for our CRM rather than just look to lift and shift so we'll take things uh, we'll take uh, work lines uh, in sequence uh, as, as the business dictates rather than do a sort of a complete sort of uh, big bang approach to that so that we ensure that what we build is the right thing and and is uh, supportive and delivers what we need for the organization um, our people work Lots of work going on in this space. Obviously, we've got our staff survey results that have just come out. We're doing a, an in-depth piece of work, as Ian said, to look at how we, how, what that, what's that telling us, both at the organisational level, but also individual teams, and doing some benchmarking and pulling some data through, so we can really start to get into into the detail of that. And as Ian said, we'll bring that back in February for more of a discussion. Uh, the work on uh, attraction and retention, we're waiting to hear back from the Treasury on our business case uh, on that, but we're also looking at the other, the other bits around our attraction and retention in terms of our non-pay uh, non offer to our staff as well. Uh, workforce strategy, we've done some work to develop our workforce strategy. That went for an initial discussion with ET um, this week. We're now starting to take the feedback from ET and pulling together a sort of delivery plan associated with that. So we're really clear that what we've got in our strategy is stuff that we'll take forward to deliver. I think that's going to come back to this board at some point in the not too distant future. And the work around our diversity and inclusion carries on. We're out to recruitment for a our diversity and inclusion lead and we're planning to come back to the board uh, in December looking at the work that we've done around Roger Klein's report and uh, continuing those discussions. In terms of the quality improvement work, um, we're starting to develop our, our target operating model for that in terms of how it's really going to work in the organisation and it's now starting to be embedded across our programmes of activity, particularly, as, particularly around registration as a, as a starting point to to look at how we can really use that to drive improvements in the processes and systems uh, that we are actually operating now, as well as making sure that our processes and systems are as lean as they can be uh, before we start to move them into a digital, digital environment. Uh, I say lots of work going on in this space, uh, uh, so I'm happy to take questions on any of that. Yeah, as you say, lots of work going on. <laughs> quite a quite a good report. Uh, quite a long report. Uh, great Sorry. stuff. No, 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 no. So, so that, was a, that was meant as a compliment. <laughs> it uh, reflects the the huge amount of work that's going on. Uh, questions, comments, Paul. Um, 
Yeah, I, uh, I just I would just add to that. I think you know we've made a huge amount of progress in the last few months around around what is a which, what is a very very big program in our in our context, uh, and I you know, and I welcome sort of seeing the, the the advances which are being made and the progress which is being made around it. I think it would be useful at the appropriate time, as we, uh, probably in the new year, um, to be able to see how it all fits with the the strategy which we we, we put out there. And I think. Um, you know, there will be some bits where you can sort of see that there would that the, that there will be elements that are working towards delivery of that strategy where we can see timelines which will deliver, and there will be some bits which are uh, where the timelines are not as firm as as as, uh, as others, and quite understandably so because we're still in the discovery bits of, 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 of we don't quite know what we're going to find. But I think it would be helpful to see all that fitting together to give us. Uh, the narrative that goes with the delivery of the the strategy and where things may still be outstanding at that point in terms in in sense that we may need to, to think about whether that strategy st still holds going forward or whether it needs to be tweaked in some sort of way but i think that, that this is a really useful piece of work to to get us towards that i look forward to seeing the confidence building behind this as well because i think the assurance work that you're doing to try and build, get confidence levels about that is good. Obviously, we want to build the confidence up further around that. You won't get 100% confident against everything, but we need to move across that, that line so that some of that red stuff starts to move down a bit because it's red in areas which are really key to the, to, to the delivery of the strategy around that. So I think that would be my, my suggestions for going forward. So just on the insurance, um, we have our internal auditors starting to look at um, both uh, our registration program and also the work we're doing around change so that should give us that verification. And yes, I agree around the piece around a strategy and I've actually commissioned a piece of work which takes our um, this program of work and looks at our strategy and maps the two together So and then we should be able to report on that on a regular basis in terms of our delivery against the strategy. John, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, thank you, Kirsten. I think a much uh, clearer narrative and a more holistic approach to this is developing. Thank you for doing that. Um, shortly, if not now, um, you'll be coming to the point where some of the process designs and improvements that you're making will need to be spread out, uh, and there'll be others that you'll need to have the involvement of. Uh, frontline people in helping that redesign, both of which cause attention in terms of time utilization um, for those people. And, but of course, the greater benefit for the organization will be that the time involved in doing something about that redesign now will pay off in dividends. Um, ha has the ET given thought, or can you perhaps come back with how um, the prioritization that they're going to give to some of that and how that's going to be managed because I think uh, particularly when you want to spread that's going to be an important thing and thinking about it now before you get to that point and giving the signals to the people in the system of expectation will be an important thing for success overall. Yes, so part of our business planning round now is about releasing, well, one of the key things is about releasing frontline resource to do some of this change piece. And I see this as um, a real opportunity for developing our talent in the front line, um, giving them a bit more scope and a bit more breadth of things to do. But it isn't, we can't expect people to do their day job and do this. So it is literally about trying to free up money and resources to pull people out of the business day to day to focus on delivering the change and working with bringing their expertise to this to ensure that we can really make sure it's fit for purpose and either funding backfill where possible or actually changing, you know, trying to create a bit of space within the business to ensure that we can do that. But what we mustn't do is try and get people to do both things at the same time because it won't work. And we've had some discussions around ET around that and our business planning is, is, is focused in around some of those conversations. Uh, Mark, I think you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chairman. Kirsty, thanks very much for this report, and uh, especially the uh, um, report on the people strategy development. You mentioned in 5.1 about um, the adaptability of the organization, uh, the changing nature of work, and you referred to the leadership conference last week, which was um, a, a, a great event from, from my point of view, and there were lots of 
seemed to me a great sense of, uh, of an appetite for the key themes there. So multidisciplinary team working, cooperative working, uh, breaking down barriers, connectedness were these key themes. And I, the workforce strategy I know is, is developing and you've discussed it this week, but are those themes woven into that strategy? A simple answer is yes. <laughs> uh, I, I say we'll bring it back to the board um, in, uh, in I think maybe next month. I'm not sure what the, I know it's in the on the it's in the plan to bring it back at some point. Um, but yes, certainly the whole point of doing this is to enable us to have a workforce that's fit for the future, to enable us to deliver on all these things. So all those things you talked about are definitely referenced in terms of and what we're doing now is trying to put a plan or we are trying we are putting a delivery plan around those so they become absolutely concrete things that we will do to help us get the outcomes that we need rather than just put words on a page that sound nice but actually mean nothing. Great. Excellent. Kirsty, thank you very much and thanks obviously to all the teams that are that, that are involved at some uh, really encouraging progress, I think. Um, so at, at, at this stage of the proceedings, we, we quite often have a, one of our own um, recognizing uh, outstanding contribution awards, um, but we don't have one this, this month. We have something different. It's an externally awarded award, uh, and it's actually an award from, uh, believe it or not, the Prosecutors' Convention Award 2018, and I'm actually going to read out the citation to you because it's really quite, I think, quite outstanding. So the citation that goes with this award um, is in recognition of its excellent work with other agencies and efficient use of resources in respect of highly important work undertaken in prosecuting offences committed in health and social care settings. So it's really quite a quite a quite a superb. Um, uh, a statement there, and it's, it's signed by the Attorney General. So I wanted to take this opportunity, uh, Rebecca, because they sit under you, but to, to, to congratulate the, um, the litigation, prosecution, and inquest team uh, for achieving that award. Um, and I think at the same time, we, we, uh, Andrea updated us earlier on um, uh, Hill Green. And I think that was not the only prosecution by any means, but it's, it, it's a recent and very high profile one. So I wanted to uh, congratulate everybody that was involved, both in the teams and, as I say, the operational colleagues that supported uh, uh, the prosecutions generally. Uh, I particularly wanted to, to, to uh, mention uh, Bina Brown, who uh, leads that team, and, and James Lester, who led the specific work on, on, on Hill Green. So I just thought it was really fantastic. So. Congratulations uh, to you and your teams. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other business that the board wanted to raise? So I then wanted to do something which is um, uh, also uh, slightly different from what we usually do, because we normally at this point open for questions from the public, and we'll do that in just a second. But on this particular occasion, I wanted to invite a member of the public to uh, come and tell us about a, a recent event. Uh, and it so happens, Bren, that you also won an award. Um, so while we're in the sort of spirit of congratulating award winners, uh, you, won, you, you won an award uh, from the Southwest Ambulance uh, Service for your uh, community work in Gloucestershire. So congratulations on that. Uh, but actually come and talk, tell us about the event that you organised in the House of Lords last week, which I wish I'd been at but couldn't be at. So, Bren, just tell us about it, please. Um, before I go into that one, uh, Peter, really, in terms of the South West Ambulance Service Award, I'm very, really, very, very clear, both with myself and everyone else, that I'm only in that position, even be close to award for the good grace and the sincerity and kindness of a number of people, a number of people around this board, a number of people in the communities, and then the number of people, other arm's length bodies, really. So um, I, I pretty much accept that award in a very humbled way, but a very clear way that it was on the basis of that sincerity and kindness that people give me day after day after day. Uh, moving on to the House of Lords, went Peter, and uh, you were there actually, Peter. We saw the video, so you were there, really. Um, 
so just a little bit of a background. I'm not, I'm not sure everyone knows about it. But in July 2016, I spoke to the then Minister David Pryor to say I'd like to have a go at something, which he then said, well, Brent, what's, you have to go at a lot of things. What you'll have to go at, really? And it was pretty much um, around three things, really. Can arms lance bodies better harmonise their approaches to engage in at a very community and neighbourhood level? The second part of it is, if, again, you're going to take the time of community and neighbour groups, what would you offer? And the third part of it really was, how can we better listen and understand the offer to arm's length bodies from community and neighbour groups, really? So he did say, well, that's not my portfolio, Brent, <laughs> which I said, is that a no? And he says, not a no. So I said, I'll take that as a yes then, really. And in a very informal way, spoke to various other arm's length bodies, laid out an, an outline to it, uh, did some pre-pilot work in Gloucestershire. And on the 7th of November 2017, uh, we, we delivered that pilot. Chris was a, a part of it. Thanks, Chris, as always. Um, and we... Um, pretty much took the arm's length bodies people to uh, venues of a greater need you know where, where people have rich diversity but a lot of disadvantage as well and with small community neighbor groups that aren't always at the table aren't always visible aren't always vocal don't have business writers and I could go on and on and on but I think people get a gist of where I'm coming from with that really and, and it was largely around, so like, of course, introducing who you were and your organisation, but then listening to those community groups, what they do day after day after day. Um, we did split it up to bigger voluntary organisations and smaller ones. And in particular, the bigger voluntary organisations did tend to have a focus on money. It came back to how much they weren't getting, etc., which I wasn't really sure was the case. And I think with the smaller neighbour community groups, actually I didn't hear the word money used much, if at all, really. It was just that, you know, very proud to do this. This is what I did on the garden. This is what I do on the voluntary um, uh, money sheds. And it, and it went on and on and on, really. And it was absolutely wonderful. We then, on the 31st of January, took a number of those community groups up to the House of Lords to rightly so celebrate that. And that was with the community groups being the absolute focus of that. So after the various introductions, you know, my decision was to give that microphone to those small community groups, not necessarily um, the, the executives from either Gloucestershire or sometimes beyond. And for those small community groups, again, just to say, you know, look, this is what I do. This is what I'm proud of. This is what I do at the Madrasa. I don't have any money. And actually, really, we're very much engaged in making support in people who are homeless or cha charities as, uh, funds to the hospital. So again, it wasn't about them. It was about more about giving, really, but again, celebrating that. Moving on to the uh, 15th of November, Peter, and your uh, fantastic video, if I might say, that we played there. Um, and we, uh, we took, a, again, a number of those small community and different groups as well. So we took a, a community group that has a local radio station, um, the which Dido Harding had visited. Uh, we took um, the small inner city farms, so in Gloucestershire, very rural, uh, and in the inner city, you know, how can some of those community groups either A, afford, or more importantly, feel that the rural aspect is, is welcoming to them? So we've actually looked to uh, take the inner city farm, which was going to be sold by the city council, to develop it add to it so it now has a riding paddock uh, to it to it as well um so, so that and and again uh, we have the um house uh, through the kindness of Earl high we have the house of lords committee room 4a uh, where normally it's the uh, public and community groups and whatever at the back of the room my decision on this case was to change that and have the community groups on the in a circle talking about what they did really. We were very privileged to have uh, Baroness Dino Harding, uh, Chair of NHS Improvement, to open that up. Uh, we had Lord Pryor, uh, because he was caught up in another uh, event on that day, joining us for the latter part of, of that as well. I think it was about two to five. Um, and again, we had a coach uh, of uh, community groups from Gloucestershire to come up and we had uh, all the organisations from Leeds, Staffordshire, 
um, Health Education England were there, Public Health England were there. Um, so it's a good, really, mixture. But but the, the absolute focus, again, if I'm totally truthful with myself and everyone around the board, um, w was for those community groups, rightly so, to say, do you know, I'd just like to tell you what, what I do day after day after day, really. Um, fantastic... Um, uh, hearing of Adam, uh, a, a gentleman that's got um, uh, has a difficult learning dif difficulty, um, mm. but was really proud to share, share about what he was going to do with his shed and how he was going to paint it out and how that was going to be his shed really. Um, so it's supported in uh, uh, local housing supported organisation. Again, a very small organisation really. So um, I think Lord Pryor again highlighted uh, what he thought at the end, really, which again, you know, it, 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 it could be about money, but in essence, we've tried that many, many times. And actually, let's look at our assets that we've got there uh, and maximise those opportunities, really. Um, so, so Peter, um, please may I take the opportunity to say thank you for the video you did and a very, a very humbling words at the end and a round of applause, but that round of applause should have been for you. Uh, Chris, can I thank you for um, all, all the, uh, the 110,000 percent support that you give to this and the, the belief in this? And Paul, can I thank you as well for for coming and, and also giving your arm raising when you're down in Gloucestershire on the the uh, song You Lift Me Up Higher Than The Mountains, active participation, I think that was where really, it was indeed. Um, so, so, the, so, of course, it's the so what question, isn't it, really? So on the 30th of uh, this month, we will take the principles of that pilot to Plymouth. I've been talking with the Director of Public Health, and they are putting those community groups together, and I've seen some of them. Um, again, the, the, the overriding principle is that exactly the same that we, we would prefer not to have the bigger voluntary organisations because my personal feeling is that they are often ready accessible, they they have uh, you know different approaches and whatever, and we absolutely need that. But if we're talking all about our inequalities, then we've got to demonstrate that and we've got to go and find and make sure we're speaking to those smaller community groups that might not just think they've got a voice and might not have a voice. So we will have that. And then on the 7th of... Uh, March, uh, Baroness Dido Harding will be joining us in Coventry, um, um, uh, Marmot City for health inequalities. So we'll be looking at those principles there. There are some further developments of that. I speak to uh, David Pryor in, in probably mid-December and got catch up with Dido and some other people and certainly the Department of Health and social care to do a presentation. But let me finish by saying thank you, <coughs> because again, none of this would be possible without the support of Chris and his team and people around the board, really. Um, and it just is that opportunity sometimes to real sense check at that very micro level at the community groups that we're not always reaching. And, it, and, and let's be honest about it, it is tough, really. But it's, it's right to do, and sometimes we need to take on board the tough things rather than the easy things to do. Uh, Peter, thank you, and thank you, the board, for this opportunity. So, uh, Bren, thank you very much, and I, 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 I know you would be very happy to welcome anybody from the board in Gloucestershire. And good things, colleagues, is you don't even need wellies to go around the inner city farm. So it's uh, well, well worth spending a, a, a day or part of a day with Bren if, if, if you have the time. Thanks, Bren. Um, any uh, were there any questions from members of the public? So the the. Um, uh, litigation prosecution inquest team have, have walked in, but you're all too late because Rebecca <laughs> Rebecca took all the credit for all the work that's, that, 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 that you guys did. But do stay and uh, join us for lunch. And uh, that, I think, is the end of uh, the board meeting. So thank you all very much indeed.